Good morning. Let me just get organized here. Thank you for being here. Those of you who, sorry, who are here live, uh, we're into module five, and the topic today is about accessing desire. So sexual desire issues are a large component of what people struggle with and what causes stress and frustration and fear and uh, hard feelings that drive this avoidance cycle. So I'm going to be tackling today a few different really important concepts about sexual desire with some um, ideas about, again, about what to do this coming week. Starting in module six next week, we get into uh, real actionable uh, touching exercise and putting all this stuff into practice to start to totally change your sex life. So I've been trying to build this up and make it doable. And next week we sort of hit the powerhouse, but this is, this is a really important uh, module and component to understand as you move forward. So I'm going to share my screen. PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry, this always takes me a little bit from the beginning. All right. So accessing desire, like I said, is the topic today. And it's common to struggle with sexual desire, to, to have easy access to that. And um, one of the concepts that we're going to talk about uh, is how important it is to want. You know, wanting uh, is an important part of, of fulfillment, of longing. You know, wanting by definition means we don't have something. And a lot of people uh, struggle to want. Now, when you explored, or you're probably still in the midst of exploring your family history, uh, but consider that a lot of us learn whether our desires are valued, whether we can expect to get those things that we want, whether it's reasonable to have expectations or whether we've given up on things. There's a lot of training that happens in our family that dictates the kind of access we have to desire not just sexual desire, desire in general. So wanting can be a struggle for people. Like uh, sometimes I'll hear that people are super easy going, go along with others, you know, sort of don't, don't have strong feelings about what they want. They're just sort of always the, the peacekeepers or, or the um, accommodating. To me, that indicates a little bit of a struggle to want, even though it's, it's peaceful, <laughs> even though you may not be in conflict over it, it can indicate a, a struggle to know what you want. It's really important that each of you individually have some access to your desire. So there are two types of sexual desire, the way I talk about it. So one of the types is what I call proactive desire. Okay, so that is, well, first of all, this is what we think of, what our culture tells us is libido and sex drive. So proactive desire and I alluded to this in one of the earlier modules, but proactive desire is where you get spontaneously interested. You know, you get aroused or horny, you're thinking about sex, you're fantasizing, you would like to make sex happen, right? This is a person that, that is thinking about sex and wants it. But there is also reactive desire. So for these people, they maybe rarely have spontaneous interests in sex. Maybe they never think about it. They don't fantasize. I mean, I've certainly had clients say they could go their whole life without sex and be just fine. And you may feel like that. Now, for a few people, that might even be true. They may not even have reactive desire. But for most people that don't feel this spontaneous interest, this proactive desire, if you got going, if things were good between the two of you, the stage was sort of set right, I don't necessarily mean candles, I mean the you know, relationship dynamics are good. If you started in some sort of physical way that worked for you, if you had enough time, if you had some input into how this goes, you start to respond. It's like you shift gears, you know, all of a sudden now your body's starting to respond, you're starting to get turned on. Now I would like sex. So reactive desire is first of all, perfectly normal. Nothing is broken. And I can't tell you how many clients I've had sit in my office and say, I don't have any sex drive. You know, they feel bad about it often. Um, or the partner might feel bad about it. And, and people tend to think this is broken, like I don't have sex drive. Yes, you do. You just have reactive drive. So part of the challenge is to figure out what's in the way of that. What are the obstacles that are blocking you from the level of desire you might have? 
and then how do we create the opportunity for it to emerge? So this is where, I, I mean, not a fancy word, but this is what I call maybe. So when, when, you, so when one of you has reactive desire, it's important to have a maybe because what has typically happens for people is there's a yes and there's a no. And there's a lot of no because you ask about sex, but I'm not feeling it right now, so I say no, right? I'm not interested right now. And you're missing that opportunity to do whatever it might do that would allow your reactive desire to show up. Not that it will every time. Absolutely, it won't. Sometimes the engine's gonna turn over, sometimes it won't. That needs to be okay with both people. This is the maybe. Well, gosh, I wasn't really thinking about sex, but let's start. Or can we, can we talk and connect first so I, you know, I can sort of shift gears? Can we, can we get the kids to bed? Can we do the dishes? You know, whatever it is. Then can we massage or kiss or, you know, let's just get going and see what happens. That maybe is, is crucial for overcoming the struggle or the block, or this what feels like an obstacle now about reactive desire. Okay, so if, you, if you're like so many people, or your partner is, that says no a lot, way upstream, because they're not feeling it now, you're missing all that opportunity for to actually feel desire. Because the goal of this course is not to get you to have more sex, it's to help you want to have more sex, to move these obstacles out of the way so that your actual desire shows up. That's what we're trying to unlock. Now, we're not trying to get you to do something you don't want. We're trying to unfree you, basically, from these burdens, from these pressures that are, what's the word I want? They're, I mean, they're sort of fabricated or they're misunderstood. Let's get that out of the way. So you go into this land of maybe and get to know it right, and have some input on how that goes and take the pressure off, and this is all a, a sort of a beautiful win. This is sort of the playground idea, right? When I said sex is like a playground, it's all about the maybe, okay? It's all about just let's go, let's have fun, let's stay as long as we want to stay, let's just see what happens. It's a win no matter what. Now, the other big uh, issue or the, the consistent theme that comes up with people that are struggling with sex is they are struggling about desire discrepancy. So, you know, basically it's, it probably describes itself, but there's, there's someone that wants more sex and there's somebody that wants less. That is true in every relationship, at least over time. Okay, this is not a problem. And you may be the higher desire partner in, in this relationship, but you've been the lower one in others, you might switch roles within your relationship now. This is, this is not like an absolute low and high. This is lower and higher. It's a system. It fluctuates sometimes. Um, levels of desire fluctuate. And again, are we talking about proactive desire or reactive desire? That affects this thing. But there's always somebody that wants more sex than the other. So that is not broken. There's no problem with that. The problem is people get caught in what I call the traps of desire discrepancy. Okay, It can feel lousy when you are struggling about this instead of um, accommodating or, or working with it in a way that's constructive. So if you are, sorry, move my little picture here. If you are the person that has less desire for sex, here's some of the challenges. Okay, first of all, you feel pressure, maybe all the time. And again, it's not because your partner is putting pressure on you. I mean, they may be, but the pressure is inherent in the system. When somebody wants something more than somebody else, there is pressure. So if you shut down in the face of that pressure, if you get resentful about that, uh, that's going to be in your way. It is a challenge uh, if you feel broken. Okay, if you think, what's wrong with me that I don't have the sex drive? Why can't I just be a normal person? Like, what's, what's going on? Especially if you combine with this with the idea of reactive desire, often this person feels broken or inadequate. It can be a challenge to not really know what it is you want, and so you feel stymied, right? You just sort of stumped right where you are. You don't know what to do about this. Now, for the person, it, you know, if you're going to fall in the trap, if you're the higher desire partner, uh, first of all, you often feel rejected, right? You take their, the, your partner's lower desire personally, as if it's some statement about how important you are, how desirable you are, how good a lover you are, how attractive you are. 
But if you put, if you take the other person's level of desire as if it's all about you, you are changing the meaning of sex. Because at that point, or over time at least, sex starts to be, there's like this urgency, this pressure. Sex starts to be about proving to you that you're actually worthy or desirable or important. So sex is about making you feel better instead of connecting with each other. This is probably something you're both very, very aware of because that kind of sex is obviously, well, maybe not obviously, less engaging. It's not very sexy if it becomes about making you feel okay about yourself. Another challenge for you as a person that wants more sex is you might feel controlled. The lower desire person has the spigot, has the control, not because they want it, often they don't, but because they want something less, again, this is inherent in the system, they say if, when, and how. So you might end up feeling very, uh, very controlled and resentful about that. Okay, and another trap for you is to pathologize your partner. What in the world's wrong? You know, you might believe, I'm normal, I've got a sex drive. What in the world's wrong with you that you don't? These are some of the problems you get into around desire discrepancy. So your job, um, if you want less sex than your partner, let's see how I want to lay this out. Um, you want to be talking about the actual obstacles that are in your way. So where you have resentments or struggles or problems or issues with your relationship dynamic, you need to be talking about those. Where, uh, where the meaning of, se of sex has become about making your partner feel good, something like that, instead of connecting with each other, you need to talk about that. In terms of accessing your own desire and what would make sex engaging for you, that's your job. It's not to sit in your comfort zone about, you know, they want this much sex, I want this much sex, I'm just going to sort of sit here and let them suffer. No, it's your job to sort of like, what could make sex more engaging? How can I create more access to desire? How can I make space and openness for reactive desire to show up? It's not about meeting them up here, but it's about being an active participant in your sex life. So if you think about, um, one way to think about what, what's going on is everything we do uh, can be from the best in us or the worst in us. You know, from good or for good and bad sounds sort of judgmental, but you know, where we're coming from sort of a healthy, uh, what do I, I'm not even sure what word I want to use, a healthy place, a grounded place, a um, reasonable place. Some of the behavior comes from that place, but other comes from the worst in us where we're not doing our best. Okay. So if you're the lower desire partner, what tends to come from the best in you is recognizing you don't want to have sex just to make your partner feel okay, to bolster their ego, to come out of neediness or obligation, right? You recognize that and you don't want to do it. That, that aversion or repellent quality, it makes sense, right? You're showing good judgment. Um, it's coming from the best in you if you know you actually want to share an experience of pleasure and connection, but somehow that's not been the sex that you've been having. Or maybe you know or at least you want to know what really good sex is. And again, that's not really matching what the two of you have been doing. So you're showing good sense and not wanting sex the way it's been happening between the two of you. Now, again, I don't say this to be judgmental. Lots of people struggle with this. It's like we're trying to recreate sex that is about pleasure and connection and is really, really healthy. And if you've been doing anything else, you not wanting to do that can show good judgment. And sometimes you're just standing your ground about your bottom line, you know? Um, and, and that can be a healthy, positive thing. But from the worst in you, and I want you to really consider whether any of this is going on for you as a lower desire partner, okay? Are you enjoying or wielding the power you have over your partner? Remember I said the lower desire partner has the control, not because you want it, but it is worth asking whether you are starting to, to enjoy it or to use it. And, it, you know, some of this sounds like, oh, nobody would ever do this stuff. Yeah, they do. <laughs> so I really want you to examine this yourself. Um, you know, confront yourself. Take it seriously. Is any of this going on? Could you be enjoying the pain that is causing your partner? If you've had resentments, uh, this might be, I guess, the definition of passive aggressive. Um, that could be happening. Are you putting off your partner and pushing it on them, like what in the world's wrong with you that you want sex all the time, that's all you think about, you know, are you sort of uh, attacking them or confronting them 
is a way to not address your own anxiety about sex, your own limitations, your own fears. You know, are you keeping the conversation on their side of the court instead of your own? Uh, are you sitting in your comfort zone, remember, this level of sex, and just letting your partner suffer, right? They've got, I mean, you know they want more sex. Are you just sort of leaving them there? Like, the, hey, this is all I got, you know, buddy, take it or leave it. Um, is, there a, is there part of you that's just sort of sitting there, not challenging yourself while your partner is suffering? And you may think you're happy there, um, but I, I would say that the best in you is not. Okay, the best in you would not be okay knowing your partner is suffering. And again, it's not just like doing what they want, but it's about solving this problem together. So for the lower desire person, figure out what's happening and confront yourself about it. So where are you coming from the, the worst and what are you going to do about it? And where are you coming from the best means you have to be talking about those things. Okay. So you've got to deal with the worst in you and shift those things. Uh, communicate with your partner. You know, I would acknowledge what you're doing. I mean, just own it. It is, um, David Snarsh is where I got some of this concepts, and he says, only the best of you can talk about the worst. So you can go ahead and say, hey, I'm, I'm actually enjoying your suffering, <laughs> or I've been not willing to confront myself and just put this all on you, or I realize I've been sitting in my comfort zone and not really making an effort for us to figure out some way to collaborate on this. And again, where you're coming from the best in you, like, I don't want to be having the sex we've been having, or I've not wanted to be having sex when it's about making you feel good about yourself. Those conversations all need to happen. Now, if you're the person that wants more sex than your partner, frequently, but not always, you get, you've gotten to a point where I've sort of given up. I'm going to just wait. I'm going to let them initiate. I'm just, you know, I'm getting so used to being rejected. I'm just not going to speak up about it anymore. That's not a helpful place, okay? You still need to be advocating for what you want and bringing up the conversation without taking it personally. You know, that's a tall ask. So the best in you is a higher desire partner. You've got the same concepts, right? What's coming from the best, what's coming from the worst. So the best in you does advocate for what you want. You know sex is important. You value it. You're in touch with your desires. That's all good, okay? You're, you know what you want, what turns you on. Um, you understand your own sexuality, your eroticism. You know, you're in touch with these parts of yourself, and the best in you would validate these desires yourself and not require validation from your partner. You know that what you want is okay. You're comfortable with the way you value sex in your life. That's all coming from a strong, solid place. But the worst in you, okay, requires validation from your partner to feel good about yourself. So again, sex is sort of reassurance. It's becoming you know, the meaning of sex has shifted from let me just connect with you and share pleasure to let me reassure myself or prove that I'm desirable or important or sexy or uh, skilled as a lover or something, okay? This be certainly becomes unpalatable to your partner. The worst in you uh, is where, you know, when you think, oh, I'm evolved and my partner is repressed, where you're really willing to pathologize each other, okay? And this is a little tricky because this is co-created, but the worst in you is happening when you accept whatever sex is offered. So sometimes what's happened to people that have struggled with desire uh, discrepancy for a while is the lower desire partner shows up and sort of barely participates. You know, maybe they just sort of lie there, or they're not very um, engaged in it, or sometimes even rolls their eyes and makes it very, very clear they don't want to be doing this, but go ahead. So you as a higher desire partner, every time you accept sex like that, that's coming from the worst in you. It's like you're abandoning your own preferences and desires. The, way, the metaphor I use for this is the lower desire uh, person is sort of throwing crumbs on the floor, and then you're eating them. So that's sort of the worst in both people, right? The lower desire partner offering crumbs and the higher desire partner eating those as a meal. Okay, that's, That needs to stop. So what to do? You've got to deal with your half of the discrepancy, figure out what's coming from the worst in you and what are you going to do about it, right? Speak up about the things you know are a problem. Um, claim the validity of your desires. And none of this is about beating your partner over the head, but just validate yourself. 
that sex is important. This is something you want to be having in your relationship. Okay. Um, admit when you've been willing to blame your partner or pathologize them. You know, if you haven't asked the question, if you're the higher desire partner and you haven't asked them, is there something going on that's in the way of you wanting the sex we've been having? Is there something else you want or that we could be doing to make this more engaging for you? If instead it's been about what in the world's wrong with you or why can't we just have sex? I mean, unless you're willing to really understand that your partner has some legitimate reasons that could be blocking their desire for sex, you're not having the right conversation. So what I want you to do this week, and again, next week we're going to get into real hands-on work together, but... Uh, I want you to, first of all, discuss these ideas. How do these apply to each of you? And it, this is point five, but, you know, whether you're going to continue to journal on this individually and then share that information or whether you just want to have a conversation, how has a desire discrepancy shown up between you? How have you fallen into these traps? And specifically, where have you been coming from the worst in you? You know, maybe you're going to have more ideas than what I covered here, but really confront yourself. That is uh, a strong thread through this entire course is where can you individually do better? What are you going to change? I think it's also important to talk about this whole idea about reactive desire. Do one or both of you have reactive sex drive? How has that gotten in the way of you engaging? How have you been stuck? Have you been stuck in a yes, no? What would it mean to have a maybe? How could you start to implement a couple of these ideas? Okay, another action step I want you to take um, and again, just because I know so many people struggle with this, so probably one, if not both of you, are struggling to say, I want about things. So a lot of people will say, hey, do you want to uh, go out to Mexican food tonight? Instead of saying, I want to go out to Mexican food. <laughs> and I know maybe it sounds like a silly example, but I, I use meals a lot because it's something you have to work out most days. Um, I want you to start saying I want or I would like as often as you can. And ideally, you each say that before you decide what to do. So if one of you says, I would like to go out to Mexican food, the other one shouldn't just say, okay. It should be, I want to go to Mexican food too, or I want to go to Chinese. And then if, if they're different, you have to figure out what to do about that. That's important uh, skill building. Shouldn't go the same person's way every time. But to start to say, I want to claim, you know, to access and claim your desires and put that into practice. Separate from sex, I'm talking about just regular everyday stuff. How you spend some of your time, what TV show you want to watch, what you want to eat. Simple things, but to develop a practice of accessing and advocating for your desire. And, you know, basically you have to tolerate not getting it. You might want two different things and you're going to have to compromise or collaborate. I have another... Um, Tool I use for people that struggle with this, you don't have to do this, but if it's a struggle to speak up about what you want, use some poker chips or pennies or some sort of tokens that you keep in your pocket, and maybe there's 10 a day or um, five a day, whatever it is, and they're reminders to you, oh right, I need to find something to say I want about. So they're just physical reminders. You don't have to like give them to each other. It's not like tit for tat, but it's like take it one pocket into the other, or one pocket onto your dresser, is it's just a reminder that you're looking for places to say I want and you're starting to practice by doing it five to ten times a day. So not everybody needs to do that, but if you really find it difficult, that's what I recommend. And then lastly, in terms of homework for this week, in addition to maintaining the other things we've been doing, um, find an opportunity for a maybe. Okay, so rather than having a yes-no, you know, binary approach to whether you're having sex or not, Find some place to have a maybe and just start, whether it's massaging or kissing or whatever would make sense to you, um, some reasonable step. But you're trying to cultivate an openness and a willingness to just sort of show up and engage a little bit where you both need to understand it's not necessarily going to lead to something. It's okay to just go to the playground, right? So that's what I want you to get into. All right, so let me... See. Okay, stop the share. I just want to open up the chat and the Q&A, because that is the end of the content. Uh, chat, there we go. I want to give you a chance to ask questions about this week's stuff if you have it. Otherwise, I will be back on Saturday morning. We've got the open office hours again on Saturday, 
Next week, we are not having a module. I'm going to be out of town at a training, so it's going to be two weeks before we're back. So that two weeks, we do module six. That's where we're going to get into the really hands-on work of this program. Uh, but you still have a fair amount to be doing, considering, and I would also imagine that at this point, you're still working through those discussion questions, all those conversations about your family history, your sexual history, what your dance around sex has been. So all of this frames up the awareness that you need to have about your dynamics and especially what you each need to be starting to change and work on, like your awareness of what your own challenges are going to be because that's all you do is pay attention to your side of the court. All right, so I am not seeing any questions in the chat or the Q&A, so I'll wrap up for today, and I hopefully we'll see you Saturday morning. Feel free to email me questions. Uh, the password protection, protected page uh, has an email form or an anonymous question form. I am starting to get some anonymous questions, but you can send those in advance. Whether or not you'll be on that Q&A uh, webinar live doesn't matter. Uh, and otherwise, you can show up and ask questions in the chat, in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand. But anyway, I'm hoping to be available and help and give some input as you move forward. Thanks, and I will see you on Saturday.